They filled up the lower level uh, in in an evening of just worship and praise, and so grateful that their hearts are oriented towards God and His goodness. Um, when it comes to grace, some of us feel like we interact with it accidentally or coincidentally. What if we could do it intentionally and habitually? What does a habit of accessing grace look like? And I'd like us to look in Psalm 139. I don't have the, the time or the space to go through every verse in this psalm, but I'd like us to begin in verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I think grace is like oxygen to our soul. And without it, we, we don't do well. I think without grace, we try really hard. And then every failure, regardless how small it is, seems to devastate us. Without grace, we tend to interpret our lives by our weakest and our worst moments. I've been told that there's a human being who actually went 11 days without any sleep. He didn't look very good after that. A lack of sleep can do a lot of damage to you, including you can even hallucinate. As devastating as a lack of sleep can be for us, I think a lack of grace is even more devastating and yet we live in quite a graceless world. And the, the question to ask is, why? Something that we need that much, why is there so little of it? And I think one of the big reasons is that no one really wants to admit when we're wrong. We want other people to admit when they're wrong, but it's really hard for us to do that. We want to experience forgiveness without acknowledging we've stepped out of bounds. And the reason for that is because we suspect that if we acknowledge we got something wrong, we're going to experience something called shame. And shame is incredibly destructive. So what I'd like you to see this morning is that confession, the, the act, the habit of confession, will lead us to some things. And the first thing it will lead us to is sorrow rather than to shame. There's a difference between those two things. Confession will lead you to sorrow, but not to shame. Shame says that you are basically an unworthy person. If you feel guilty, you might feel like you did a bad thing, but if you feel shame, you feel like you're a bad person. Shame says that you will never be worthy, you'll never be noticed, you'll never be appreciated, you'll never be recognized, and you don't deserve anything, that, that no one really cares about you, and, and, and shame paralyzes us in ways it's, it's very hard to describe or define. Scripture actually identifies that there's a difference between the world thinks about this and the way that God thinks about this. In 2 Corinthians, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow, this is the shame kind of stuff, that brings death. People who have done a lot of research, have discovered that at the root of things like addiction and depression and violence and suicide and eating disorders is often shame. It drives some of our most destructive behaviors. Confession is how God addresses our mistakes and our misdeeds without using shame. This is a very important concept. Confession focuses on our behavior, but it doesn't change our identity. You still belong to God. Uh, confession will lead you to sorrow, not to shame. 
Now, the thing is that we're not really good at confession, and we haven't seen many examples of it done well in our world. In lots of families, no one ever really takes responsibility. They just keep blaming the next person until it finally rests with the most defenseless one in the family. Some of you have been that person in a family. And some people in our world have actually never admitted any sinful behavior. They've always had an excuse or they've always had someone to blame. Even when we apologize, have you ever noticed how likely we are to protect ourselves in our own apologies? The reason that this is important is because confession can also lead us to healing. The Bible tells us that if we confess, we will be healed. It's a very powerful thing. So let me give you a couple examples of apologies, and, and you can decide what, which one you think is more healing. Here's example number one. I'm sorry if I hurt you. Okay? How about this one? I'm sorry that I hurt you. I realized the reason I responded the way I did is because I was feeling insecure. I believe God is showing me how I can avoid do, doing that in the future. Will you forgive me? If someone were apologizing to you, which of those apologies would be more healing? And when we apologize to others, just think about that. Which one would you rather heal? Confession also leads to growth. It heals the wounds and the pain of our lives, but it also grows areas of our lives. So here's another couple of examples of an apology, all right? Here's how about this apology. Okay, I could have been more truthful. <laughs> okay. You could be better at apologizing too, but obviously you struggle in both those areas. Or how about this? Let me just ask, do you think saying something like that really gives you the opportunity to grow it all in your life? Or like this, I told a lie to you because I wanted to avoid getting in trouble. Which confession is the one that's more likely to give you an opportunity to learn something about yourself and grow from it? Confession is like an anti-invisibility cloak. It's what you take off so that the inside of you can be seen. We stop hiding, and this is why it's important. You can't have privacy and God's presence at the same time. Hiding is a form of running from God. It was first enacted by Adam and Eve, and it's been reenacted by every human since. In order to grow from our mistakes and our misdeeds, we need to learn to confess. And to learn to confess well, we need to ask three essential questions. And the first is, what did I do or what did I fail to do? What is it? What did I do? Ask yourself, what did I do? Sometimes we struggle identifying what those things are. But if you think about it, there's a way to turn it around so that you can see it a little bit more clearly. If someone did that to me, how would I feel about it? If someone said that to me, if they had taken that from me, if they had not defended me, how would I feel about that? And so def defining that what, describing it, is a really important part. But don't stop there. Go to the why did I do that. This, this moves just from focusing on behavior and starts identifying motives and attitudes. And that's a really big deal. If we only focus on behaviors, please hear this. If we only focus on behaviors, we will actually become worse sinners. If all we do is focus on behaviors, we will look better and get worse. And it happens all the time. In religious communities, there's a lot of temptation just to focus on the behavior because we want everyone to look good, at least for a little while. That's why our services are only an hour long. We know you can't hold it together longer than that. <laughs> so, 
just get in and get out before we fall apart. But here's what happens. When all we do is focus on the behavior, we can change a behavior, and then something happens. We start getting a little smug and a little prideful because we were able to change that behavior, and other people aren't able to change that behavior. And let me ask you, how easy is it to love someone when you're feeling smug and prideful? We actually become less loving. It's a problem. So we have to ask why, and we have to ask why. And then thirdly, ask what happened as a result of my sin. And identifying it as sin is a really challenging thing for us. How did we hurt ourselves? How do we hurt someone else? How do we hurt a relationship? Who did we embarrass or did we embarrass ourselves? What trust was broken? I, on, on my flight home yesterday, I, I was sitting next to a guy in the plane, and within 10 minutes, I knew a lot more about this guy than, than, than you could possibly imagine or that I can tell you. And I decided just a couple of minutes in, there's no way I'm telling this guy I'm a pastor. Because he is going to be so embarrassed because he was telling me all kinds of stuff. Like, I thought for half a minute this might be a confessional. I didn't know. I thought, and he's just laughing about it, and his language is dicey. I mean, he's just, he is something else. And, and like, he doesn't just, his, the stuff he does, he doesn't just do in one state or one country. And so I'm just, I'm just sitting there, and, and he asked me, so, what do you do? And I'm thinking, I want out of this. I said, well, my... My wife is a pharmacist. <laughs> she sells drugs legally. That's all I'm going to say. It's okay when she does it. So before he did what he's doing now, which actually was a finance job, he actually worked in a jewelry store. And when he worked in a jewelry store, he said there's all kinds of people, all kinds of reasons that people buy jewelry. I said, really? Tell me about that. And he said, well, there's a thing called a push ring. Anybody heard of this? <laughs> yeah, it's when, when the mom has the baby, you push out the baby, you get a ring. <laughs> when, when, when Susan pushed out a baby, she got a baby. I, didn't, I wasn't in the loop on the jewelry part of this. And then he told me something else. He told me that there's a thing called, it's called a guilt ring. A guilt ring. I said, what's a guilt ring? I've never heard of this. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, it's when, <laughs> it's when a girl catches her boyfriend cheating. And he goes and buys an engagement ring. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, it happens a lot. I said, how effective is that? He said, it works every time. I said, you are kidding. He said, I am kidding. He said, a lot of those rings come back the next day. <laughs> Just, we, we don't want to acknowledge that we did something that broke someone else's trust, and we think that by giving a gift, we can repair the damage. It actually doesn't work. We have to learn how to confess. It brings healing and produces growth. What confession you, you might just be one confession away from healing today or one confession away from growing today. We will never grow and we will never heal from an excuse that we make or by blaming someone else. You don't need to grow and you don't need to heal when it's someone else's fault. So if we're going to do this whole confession thing, I have to tell you, there's a lot of unhealthy ways to do it and I've seen it done that way. And quite honestly, I've done it that way myself sometimes. That's why Psalm 139 is so critically important to our understanding about how to have a solid biblical framework for entering into something that helps us regularly access God's grace. So how do you practice confession? And the first thing is remember that God is everywhere and pays attention to everything. That's what he says, right? He says, you see my rising up, you see my lying down, you even know the words I'm going to say before they come out of my mouth. You see everything there is to see about me, which means there's no sense pretending with God. 
He knows our location. He knows our actions. He knows our tendencies. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our personalities. He knows our fears. He knows our hopes. He knows our dreams. He knows our ambitions. He knows our desires. He knows it all. So why do we pretend with him? Just start with the understanding. He already knows, which can be a little unsettling, but that's why the second point of Psalm 139 is so important, and that is God knows you better and loves you more than anyone else. He knows you better and loves you more than anyone else. The love in our world, in our experience, is very conditional. When you break enough trust, you break the relationship. We've all had moments when we opened our heart and revealed something about ourselves and then watched someone create distance and walk out of our lives. And those are death blows that we don't recover from very well. And we start making decisions. I am never going to do that again. But God comes to us, and his approach is completely different. He doesn't abandon us when we acknowledge what is true about us. He knows you better and loves you more than anyone. God has, and this is what it says, God has so many thoughts about you that they can't be numbered. If you could number all the grains of sand in the world, not just on the beaches, but the deserts, everywhere you can find sand, put them all together, God's thoughts toward you are more than that. And how does the psalmist describe those thoughts? They're precious. He sees you as a person of great value and with great dignity. That's what that word means. Great value and great dignity. Which brings us to our third point. Now, now understand this. If we're going to get to point three, we got to do one and two if we want to do this well. God is everywhere. He sees everything. He knows me better and loves me more than anyone, which brings me to the third thing. Now I have to name my failure. And this is where it gets difficult because a lot of people can misinterpret the fact that God highly values us and has deep respect for us as though that he approves of everything we do. And it's not the same thing. The goal of understanding God's thoughts towards us are not to excuse us from our actions and attitudes. The goal is to provide a safe place for us to bring out into the light the things we're tempted to hide. And that is the difference between sorrow and shame. You see, when you see what God sees, you will feel what God feels. When you see what God sees, you will feel what God feels. And when he sees our sin, His heart is broken. See, we always define sin as the breaking of God's rules, and the truth is it's the breaking of God's heart. Because God God knows how he has created us and what he's created us to become. And he knows when we injure ourselves and we do damage to others, and he sees all of the collateral damage that's done. And it breaks his heart. You see, confession isn't just an exchange of information. It's not just saying, yeah, I did it, so what? We've all watched those movies on television, right? Where, where if someone finally breaks down on the witness stand because there's too much evidence and too many questions. All right, I did it. That's not all that confession is. Confession also enters into the pain that we have caused God and others. It leads us to sorrow, but not to shame. Sorrow is the evidence that you understand what has been done to you and what has been done by you. It's amazing how often things get done to us and we just try to shrug it off. It's not a big deal. But sorrow is the way that we acknowledge that is a big deal. And sorrow is also the way we acknowledge what we have done. You see, grace always accepts us as we are, but never leaves us as we are. Grace always accepts us as we are, never leaves us as we are. So what do you need to confess to God? What I can tell you is if you're going to start this journey on a regular basis, it's going to take courage and it's going to take trust, and I think that's what the life of faith really is. So just before I leave this conversation this morning, I want to bring one more verse to your attention, and it comes from 1 John. And it says, if we confess our sins, 
if we do this. He is faithful and just and will, what's the next word? Forgive, forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I, I was studying this verse this week and it occurred to me, this verse doesn't say if we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he forgives. And here's what I honestly think. I think some of us think this whole grace thing and this whole God thing and this whole church thing doesn't work for us because we are still pummeled inside and we carry a kind of weight around with us that just wears us out. And I'm wondering if it's not because we haven't spent enough time in rooms like this or haven't read enough of a book like this, but because we haven't said the things out loud we need to say to God. Sometimes we need to say them to someone else. And when we do that, he is faithful, and he is just, and he forgives. And that is a very different way to live. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, honestly, I don't completely trust myself to see all the ways that I got something wrong. I've got a lot of blind spots in my life. And I managed to live at a pace quick enough that I can just kind of blow by stuff that I could have paid more attention to. When my response was harsh. When my words caused pain. when my abruptness made a person feel less valued. And it is so easy just to keep going as fast and hard as we can. But there comes a fatigue to our soul. There comes a weariness to life. Things go slower feel heavier and we're so tempted to think none of this works why am I doing it and I want you to know that grace is not released because you sat in a chair today or you partook of a cup and bread today that grace isn't released because you're in the right room and you're hearing the right words grace is released when we're willing to acknowledge to God I am a broken mess. I step out of bounds. Even when I'm well intended, I wind up hurting others. And I don't want to pretend that it's not true. And I don't want to pretend that it doesn't happen. And in that moment, grace flows like a river into your life. If you want grace, stop excusing, stop pretending, stop blaming. Just start acknowledging, this is where I stepped out of bounds. And you'll be surprised what God can do with that. So, Father, we want to hear your voice. We don't just depend on ourselves to figure this out. So we finish the way the psalmist finished his, his song. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me, God. Know my anxious thoughts. Look and see if there's anything offensive in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together this morning.